even with the best and most solid and accurate and in-depth results of your qualitative study, there are so many ways in which you can get the findings or the results chapter wrong. And this in turn leads to your whole dissertation or your thesis being marked down. And so many times when I was asked to review these chapters, I consistently pointed to the same mistakes over and over and over again. So in this video, I'm reviewing these most common mistakes and showing you how you can uh, fix these mistakes quickly and in a very easy way. So number one is lack of signposting. So um, that's great, that's interesting, but what is signposting? Signposting is basically a link in different elements of your work, of your writing to each other, which means you can link forward, you can link, uh, link backwards. It's basically about clarity and explaining and guiding the reader through your chapter, guiding the reader through your, your whole dissertation or thesis. Uh, I often explain that uh, you should remember that your reader, which is usually the main, the, main uh, the most important reader, of course, is the person marking your dissertation or uh, your thesis. And I often explain that you have to uh, imagine your reader being somebody who's possi possibly disengaged, possibly tired, possibly bored, so uh, maybe they are not, hopefully they are not, but imagining all these things will definitely uh, help you remember uh, just how important that uh, clarity is, uh, is and how important it is to guide uh, that reader through that work, uh, through your written work, uh, to help them navigate uh, through your thesis. It's also very important, I mean, it's, it's very easy to uh, forget for you uh, just how important it is because you are so immersed in that work of course you've been immersed in that work you've been uh, doing that for uh, so many hours now that is just very difficult to see what's possibly unclear to somebody who's a complete outsider so signposting is basically explaining as explained as noted in section one and chapter one as explained further in chapter six, or as discussed further in chapter six, as evident in table 5.1. So basically all these things where you're explain, you're making links, you're helping the reader connect and make links between the different sections, different parts of the chapter. You're showing them where you first mentioned something. You're, you're explaining that maybe later you'll uh, discuss something further. So, so all that stuff, uh, to just help them make sense of it and uh, help them remember where things are. Because I often explain that uh, as a reader, I won't be uh, I won't be going through your whole work and trying to locate where you first mentioned something unless you tell me exactly where it is. So which page or which section you need to tell me where that was first mentioned. So this is basically what signposting is about, as well as any other. Uh, such expressions, any other such attempts to basically link the different elements of your uh, of your thesis or dissertation. So again, explaining what's about to come, explaining uh, how what I'm reading now relates to what I just read a few minutes ago, explaining how the next section is building upon what I'm saying and what I'm showing you in this section. So all these things. Remember, again, there is no way for me to ever overstate, overemphasize the importance of this. It needs to be super clear. Uh, to the reader where everything in your work is. You have to constantly guide them through all that structure, through everything you're showing them. This also means reminding them about uh, the research questions at the beginning of your chapter. So here is uh, what I often see uh, these chapters missing. So uh, you're jumping straight into the findings and I can't even remember the research questions. Again, you'd love to uh, to think that that the reader will know everything about your work. Obviously, they will remember every single research question and they will remember the aims because they've been reading your uh, thesis or dissertation. They read your literature review, your introduction. However, again, there's so much information to digest for uh, for that outsider, that reader, that it's uh, is simply not going to hurt uh, anyone. It's not going to cause any harm to remind them the research questions again. And that's the first thing you need to do at the beginning of your uh, results chapter. You can even do that later in uh, particular sections of that chapter. Again, there is no harm in this. And another major, major thing about uh, signposting and clarity and all that, and something I see missing almost every single time and almost every single chapter that I see, is the lack of visual representation of your results at the beginning. So uh, I always advise my students uh, that the first thing you should do after reminding the, uh, the reader about the research questions is to show them what you found uh, in your study. So it's to summarize very briefly, extremely briefly, what you found. So literally the main thing that you can say 
about your findings if you're asked and then uh, point them to the table ideally or some other uh, visual representation uh, of your results that shows uh, what you found so presents your themes and sub themes and again this is uh, possibly the main thing the most important thing that you can do because this will uh, guide the reader through the, the whole rest of the results they can always uh, go back to that table or whatever visual form you chose to represent your results they can always go there as they are reading they can always look at this they can always know what's coming next and they will know what theme you're discussing so basically that's that's the main thing and this leads me to a very similar and very related point so general lack of clarity about how your findings the findings you're showing me are answering uh, your research questions so again this may be due to the fact that you didn't remind me your research questions and what they are at the beginning or it could be for any other reason i do have uh, well firstly i have videos in which i go through some of the points discussed in this video so feel free to watch them where for example i talk more about the structure of uh, of uh, the results chapter as well as some common problems and secondly, I have uh, obviously have plenty of videos in which I talk uh, about uh, the analysis itself. So how to get to that stage that we're discussing now to have these results. In some of these videos, I often uh, reflect on how we decide about the themes that you want to have in your final thematic framework, your final results. And this could be one of the reasons, uh, lack of clarity and how you d develop these themes and what you're deciding to show the reader may later result in the reader's confusion as to how what I'm seeing is answering these research questions. So needless to say, of course, if you decide uh, and you choose to, uh, to keep a certain theme or certain sub theme or generally certain finding, it has to be clear to me why you're keeping, uh, keeping that finding and why I'm, I'm reading what I'm reading. This is not to say that you have to always link every uh, research question to every finding. That's uh, absolutely not the case. And often I see attempts, uh, people's attempts to do that. And I'll come back to that in this uh, video again, but you don't always have to do it. It doesn't have to be that every research finding is clearly uh, related and linked to one specific research question. Uh, sometimes you may have findings that uh, are not directly linked to a research question, but it's still clear to the reader overall how uh learning and knowing about the things that you're telling me about how it generally contributes to me understanding the context and being able to answer your research questions so now let's do a quick ad break and i'll be right back if you're struggling with your research study remember that there are many ways in which i can support you i offer for example a variety of private tutorials during which i can support you at different stages of your study. We can uh, plan your research questions and research design, for example, review your research proposal, or review what you have already done in your study. I can also guide you through your analysis or answer any question about your study or research in general. I can also analyze your data for you and provide a high quality report of the findings. I can guide you through using different AI tools for your research, as well as offer a variety of other forms of support. So feel free to have a look at my website and the different services that I provide and reach out if you have any questions. Another challenge or a group of challenges are all sorts of problems with quotes again i have a video in which i talk specifically about this but there are so many problems with how people use quotes and that's again among the most common things i point out and comment on if i if i'm reading your chapters your results chapters so uh, there are many problems for example uh, over relying on quotes that's a big problem if you just keep uh, showing me quotes quotes are great and you know that i like them and i said that so many times Quotes are what makes uh, this chapter engaging, uh, interesting, less boring, and also convincing. So I absolutely love quotes. However, you can't just uh, be throwing the quotes at me constantly and forcing me basically to, uh, to interpret what they are saying, why they are here, why am I seeing these quotes? So I often see chapters where there is just one quote after another, after another, after another, uh, which is not good. So of course you need to have some balance. Again, as I said, I discussed that more in that video uh, that, I, uh, that I posted some time ago, but you need to have balance uh, between your quotes and, and the narrative, I mean, your narrative and the quotes rather than just keeping, uh, throwing these uh, quotes at me. On the other hand, of course, there is uh, the opposite problem 
uh, namely not enough quotes. So if you just keep telling me things but never show me any quotes, I'm going to start wondering whether this in fact comes from the data. So the finding is actually evident from the data or maybe you're biased, maybe you're just interpreting things that are not uh, there. So of course you need some quotes. So as I said again, uh, you need a nice balance uh, between quotes and your own perspective, your own narrative. There's a whole bunch of other problems uh, such as uh, not enough uh, explanation of the quotes. So again, you're just showing me quotes, but I have no idea why they are here what kind of point they demonstrate. So it's very common that you're discussing things or uh, reporting things, and then you just uh, insert that quote, which is fine. I can kind of figure out why it's there because you were just talking about a, a certain topic, but it's not enough. It's not enough. You have to tell me directly, as shown in the following quote, it was found that this happened, for example. Or if you're demonstrating a certain point, you're telling me that you know school teachers uh, we're struggling with this and that problem. Uh, again, say such as the case, such was the case with the following teacher who reported that this and that happened. Just tell me something about the quote. Make sure that I know exactly why you're showing me that quote. Then there are quotes that are way too long. So try to avoid quotes that are really long. I would say, you know, more than four or five, six lines. Occasionally it's okay to have them, but not if you have three or four such long quotes on one page. So uh, as well as if you have that longer quote, even more important is that explanation that I mentioned. So tell me what I'm seeing, what I need to pay attention to in that quote, rather than just showing me this long quote. There are also quotes that are too short. So on the other hand, if there is a quote that's not even one line long, it's okay to have it, but ideally try to use it in the text rather than indent it and separate it with spaces. So it looks weird when there is a short quote and it's uh, singled out like that. So all sorts of problems with quotes and the format uh, of these quotes uh, among the key problems. So again, how to fix it? Of course, try to follow uh, the advice that I just provided. Just make sure that they are meaningful. It's very clear. The reader always knows why the quote is there and make sure that there is enough of your narrative because that's important. Quotes are important, but your narrative is even more engaging and important, or at least it should be. Don't forget to check out my ebook entitled Scholar's Guide to AI Assisted Thematic Analysis, which is a useful resource for thematic analysis, whether you do plan to use AI or not. It contains plenty of useful advice, step by step instructions for thematic analysis, and a list of prompts that you can copy and paste into ChatGPT. And then finally, confusing structure of the whole chapter. Again, I have a whole video in which I go through these different models. Uh, of uh, a findings chapter and how you can structure that chapter. I know it doesn't help that it's all so flexible. Uh, I often tell uh, my students uh, almost uh, every question they ask me, my response starts with, it depends. And I hate to do that. And I, I know that some of you and including myself may like this kind of flexibility, but I also understand how it's problematic because uh, the answer to everything is it depends. How do I structure that chapter? It depends, uh, but it really, does depend. Uh, I do have that video, but I'll quickly summarize here just so you know what I'm talking about. So there are so many ways in which you can structure that chapter. You can structure the chapter by uh, the research questions, for example. So you have uh, you can have sections that uh, describe uh, certain research questions, separate research questions in your study. And then under each research question, you're basically telling me about the relevant findings, uh, which is fine in some cases. In other cases, you can have a chapter where you structure it by the main themes, which is usually my main, uh, my most, uh, my favorite uh, structure, the way I structure the results. Uh, but it's my personal preference. And also, it's not always the case if it doesn't seem to suit the results I'm describing. So, so uh, basically, you have the sections. Uh, corresponding to your main themes. Under each section, uh, which is the name, uh, the main theme, I'm reporting on everything that's important about that theme. Then I could structure the results around my methods. So if I have focus group results, interview results, observation results, I could uh, have separate sections uh, for each of these uh, data sets and describe the results there, in which case, of course, I'll have a mixture of different themes, for example, under the interviews, a mixture of different themes under uh, the observation and so on and so forth. So it's it's a either or. So I'm now reviewing the different models. So if you're doing this one, you can't really have, you know, organize your findings by 
the research questions or the themes. Uh, you can organize the findings by the different groups. So if you have teachers and students, again, you can have teachers, student data. So, so many different models and it's entirely up to you how you decide to structure your results. So how do you decide? Because of course, like I said, it doesn't help if I just tell you it depends and it's up to you. But mainly you just decide uh, by thinking about what's the most, what's the clearest, <laughs> is, that a, is that a word? The clearest? the most clear, I believe it's the most clear. So what's the best way to uh, to present the results in a clear way? Uh, you know your results, you know them by heart. So uh, the objective is to make sure, and I often say that, that your reader knows as much about your results as you do. So how do you achieve that? That's your decision. Remember that you have to remember that, that you can and you should take ownership of your results. Nobody can tell you how to do it. You have to decide what's the best way to do it. So that's the, the way to address that problem because otherwise, and that's the problem that I, I'm talking about in this section of this video, uh, sometimes people choose the wrong way. So they force it into, for example, uh, describing by the research questions, and it becomes confusing for all sorts of problems. Maybe there is a big mixture of different methods under each research question, different themes, for example. Um, sometimes they force it into one way or another. So it just doesn't seem to uh, to fit their, uh, their results, the results in their study. Because, of course, every way, every model that I describe has different uh, advantages and different weaknesses. So at the end of the day, you have to make that decision, uh, decide what's best for you, how you feel uh, the most confident, which way uh, you know report of reporting your results gives you most confidence. And that's the main criterion, how you should choose the right way. But if you want me to talk more about these different structures, for example, do let me know in the comments and I'll go into much more detail, perhaps reviewing each of these structures to help you understand. Otherwise, remember what I said in the advert, you can reach out and I can help you with your uh, dissertation on study in many possible ways. Uh, please like the video if you felt that you learned something new, comment below, like I said, ask questions or anything else that you want to point out and consider subscribing if you're not a subscriber yet.